So I'd like to bring forward Professor, not Professor, we're going to say entrepreneur, uh, MD, PhD, Stephen Quay, who came all the way from Taiwan for this hearing, to tell us a little bit about why, uh, you know, one, prof one scientist today was still saying it came from the came from the wet market. Why did it not come from the wet market? And what's some of the science behind why you think it existed beforehand? Yeah, so I, what, what, what you can do is you can look at the genetic code. I mean, so we have a lot of humans and they can tell the truth, they can not tell the truth, they can lie, they can do all sorts of things. So my focus has been, what does the virus tell me about it? It's almost like looking at a, you know, a body at a crime scene. What can you find in the way of clues? One of the clues is that all of these viruses have what's called a molecular clock. So, uh, so they're, they're, they copy themselves with quite high fidelity, but about every two weeks they make a mistake. So if a virus has been circulating for a year, it's going to have how many mistakes? About 26. So in SARS-1, when they looked at the virus in the 11 different markets it was in, there were 30 different letters that were different in the pattern in these markets that they could say, you know, this thing, this thing was in its first cat, civet cat, about a year ago. And this posterior diversity, as it's called, was present in SARS-1. It was also present in 2014-15 in MERS. They could see the same thing. They could see it going back in the camels in the Middle East, where it had been infected. And, but it also always starts in a bat. And that was about a two or three year diversity. Uh, what is the posterior diversity of SARS-2? Zero. Zero. Every person who was infected in this room has a virus that can be traced back to an atom you know, Adam and Eve to an Adam virus, one virus in one person in Wuhan. I, even, every time I think that and say it, it just marvels me that we have two billion people infected and it started with one person in, in the laboratory there. I was working with the State Department in the fall of 2020 because I, I published a paper where I basically looked at what hospitals people went to in Wuhan. And there's nine different subway lines, and it turned out all the hospitals were along, along line two. What did that line have on it? The Wuhan Institute of Virology, the market, and the international airport. And a million people a day were going on that line. So my, you know, I'm, I'm not a government guy, as, 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 as Dr. Paul said. I, I've invented seven drugs that are FDA approved on the, on the biotech side. But I get a, my secretary gets a call from a guy at the State Department and said, hey, you published this paper and, and you know, you're replicating the work we're doing behind closed doors here. Would you please come in and help us? And, and I did in the, in the fall of 2020 and into 21. So um, statistically, you know, we're looking at odds. What are the odds it came from animals? What are the odds that it came from a lab? So the virus has certain characteristics, and one of the things they talk about is a special cleavage site that's in the virus. Uh, was there evidence that the Chinese were doing research inserting this cleavage site in other viruses over time? It's, is it part of gain of function? Is it unusual? What are the odds that this virus would have a furin cleavage site in it versus what happens in nature in that particular family? Yeah. So we learn everything, everything we learn about viruses and in biology, we learn from nature. So um, the, the, the um, viruses, viruses, many viruses, have what, what I call two-step authentication, which means they have to have a receptor they bind to, but then they have to have a protein on that same cell that clips their spike and like a hypodermic needle shoots the, the RNA or the DNA into the cell. And this two-step authentication uh, is a unique feature. So HIV has a furin cleavage site. Many, many viruses have furin cleavage sites. Since 1992, virologists have been putting them into virus and seeing what, do they, what happens. Every time it makes them more virulent. So SARS, the SARS that, uh, the family of viruses SARS-2 came from, a thousand years of, of time back to the time the most common ancestor when the beta coronaviruses split, and this class came about the time William was crossing that, that channel into England. Um, none of these viruses have ever had a furin cleavage site. And we've looked at 800 or 1400, the number varies, but um, you all should take statistics. Because what, what that means is that the probability this came from nature is you know, under 1%, under 0.5%. And so you look at various aspects of it because then you look at, well, what are the letters of the furin cleavage site in SARS-CoV-2? Oh my gosh, it has two three-letter codons that are never used by coronaviruses. Uh, so so, 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 so virus. basically you have DNA and then the nucleotides from DNA are codons. When you get three of them, they code for an amino acid. And so an amino acid becomes a protein. And so if you look at uh, an amino acid, it's like there's 36 different ways you could have the letters for one or for two. Well, so uh, since there's four letters you can use and the codon is three, you can, there's 64 codons. 
for all the amino acids, and there are only 20 amino acids, 64 codons, they're redundant, which is kind of interesting. So for example, the arginines that are at the furin cleavage site have six different codons for them. The one codon that's in the furin cleavage site of SARS-2 is used 2% of the time. So out of the 64 codons in SARS, in the coronaviruses, the 60 second least used is the one that's in SARS-2. So it's, it's circumstantial evidence. It's the evidence that this special cleavage site is not seen in this family of viruses, hasn't been seen since William the Conqueror, and then it's put in, and it turns out that the sequence, the codons, which is the DNA that codes for the amino acids, turns out that that code is one they commonly use in labs, that laboratory people use to insert furin cleavage sites. It's not as common in the human kingdom, in the animal kingdom. So it could be a coincidence, but it's like one after another, and then didn't you do some statistics on one coincidence adds up to another? What would it actually take to have come up with a virus like this in nature? Yeah, it, it, has, it has seven features, the backbone, the receptor, the part that binds to the, to the, uh, to the human cell, this furin cleavage site in, in, in its existence, and then its codon. You know, so you add these seven together, and they're independent, so a statistician can treat each of them separately. And you end up with a probability that a, the virus with these seven characteristics has a chance of 1 in 1 1.2 billion of coming from nature. And there was a proposal in 2018 called the DARPA. Uh, DARPA is the agency, but there was a proposal made to do some research. Why does that suggest that the, that the, it may have occurred, the leak may have come from the lab? Yeah, go, a great question. So, for those of you who are a little bit younger than me, I just, DARPA was the scientific group in the military that developed Agent Orange that was used in Vietnam, and we now think that that was pretty problematic. So this is a grant that DARPA said was too dangerous to do, and that's my backdrop to it. So it was a proposal by Dr. Barrick in North Carolina, uh, Desik at, in New York City, uh, 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 Shinji Shi in uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology, and a gentleman by the name of Lin Fu Wong up in Singapore. Um, they were going to take, they were going to create a bat vaccine by doing a bunch of stuff with the coronavirus. They were going to put it on sticky particles and they were going to spray it into a cave. The bats would get it all over themselves and when they cleaned each other, they would take it in and it was a vaccination for bats. Does, does that just on its face seem a little crazy? Well, uh, what could go wrong? <laughs> we're going to spray, we're going to spray a coronavirus in a cave and, and see what it, happens. And it's got to be a live virus then, right? Yeah, yes, it absolutely does because it has a to reproduce. A live virus, we're going to spray in a cave and there's a couple million bats flying around the cave. What could go wrong? So uh, what, what kind of virus were they, gonna, were they going to do to develop this spray technique? Um, it was a virus from a particular cave in a particular region uh, about 1,500 kilometers from Wuhan uh, in southern China. Uh, you know, it's as far as from here to the Everglades. As, as I like to say, you know, what the people who think it came from a market uh, are telling you is you're sitting, you're sitting in a restaurant in North Bethesda, you're looking out at the National Institute of AID Laboratories, you get sick with the virus, and they say, well, you know, it came from bats in the Everglades, but they're actually working on it in that lab over there out the building. That's what they want you to believe. So what they wanted, so it was a virus from southern China. <clears throat> and they were going to uh, train it to infect humans uh, by growing it on humanized mice. They were going to either, if it had a furin cleavage site, they said it might. It's never been seen before in nature, but if it didn't have one, they were going to put one in. Um, they, they were, uh, you know, then going to, to uh, put it, as I said, put it in these particles. So uh, DARPA decided that it was maybe a, a gene drive or there were various reasons, safety reasons, why they didn't go forward in funding it. Um, but, but we don't, and we don't know that it was funded, but we, before we get to whether it was funded or not, through, again, through FOIA, the remarkable thing is, so you have this grant that they've given to the government where they've said one thing about what they're going to do in writing. They're going to, they're going to make the virus, the, this dangerous virus, in pretty safe labs in, in North Carolina. Uh, and, then, and then we got drafts of this where they're talking to each other about, how, about what they're going to do. And in the drafts, Peter Daszak says, you know, we're going to try to be really cost efficient and, and quick and things. So we'll tell them we're doing it in, in the safe labs in North Carolina. We'll go do them at the Wuhan Institute of Virology where we know they're, they're a lower safety level. We can get cheaper, them. cheaper, cheaper, faster, better. <laughs> I'll leave that out. Um, and Dr. Barrick, who's in North Carolina and who's, a, I think, a pretty responsible scientist from what I can tell, said in the margin, said, well, you know, if American scientists knew that they were going to do this, they would, be, they would think we were crazy. 
So all of this was a setup for then when Cyrus appears and has all of the elements, has seven elements of this grant, Barak and Dasek and maybe Dr. Fauci, all these on the DARPA people should have said in January 2020, you know, this thing looks really like the virus we proposed to, to make in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Maybe it came from a lab. I'm going to finish with Dr. Quay and give an answer of what happened just recently at MIT to indicate that the regulations that the Biden administration put in place didn't work. Yeah, so the regulations are... What's that? The guidance. Yeah, they're guidance. guidance. Okay. They, have no, right. they have no enforcement right. of law. So a, a good idea, but when you tested it, it didn't work. The idea was that if you ordered... The, the 1918 influenza. Let's say you wanted to, you wanted to build that in a laboratory. You, you would break it up. You would break your order up around, let's say, 10 different labs that would make pieces for you. Each one would make a small piece of it, and then you'd assemble it back in your lab. So their guidance was to tell these lab, these labs that make this, how to not fill those orders. So three scientists at MIT did a red team experiment. They contacted the FBI first because they were kind of worried about what they were about to do. They ordered the 1918 influenza in pieces from laboratories to see if they would fill the order or would they say, hey, we can't fill that order. 94% filled the order. They got it back. They had the FBI watch over there. They made the, the wrong strand, so they showed they could put it together. Uh, you know, DNA goes one way and the other way, so the other way doesn't make a virus at all. They, they showed they could do it. So their, sure, the Twitter version is that their guidance doesn't work. All right. Questions and, oh, and, and can I have one oh, more? Yeah, go ahead. So I, there is evidence of what's going on. So March 2019, 30 vials of the three most deadly viruses on the planet, Ebola, Hendra, and Nipah, are sent from Canada, Canada's only business, to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The three Chinese scientists are arrested by the mounted police, escorted out. We don't know what happened. They're sent back to China. December 2019, I and my colleagues find the Nipah virus in patient samples in, Wuhan, in the Wuhan laboratory undergoing cloning. So they're making an infectious clone of the Nipah virus. This is, this is beyond the pale, and that's a 75% lethal virus. So that's what we're up against.